Hello everyone. Uh, so today I wanted to take some time to talk about damped harmonic motion. Um, one of the things we've talked about a lot until this point is just regular harmonic motion, right? We just have, we have some kind of uh, starting point for an oscillation. So we have like a, a block on a spring and that motion is this, is this cosine graph where it just oscillates back and forth and the amplitude stays constant the whole time, right? Which means that if the amplitude stays constant, the energy stays constant. So what we know is that the total energy in the system is equal to one half K times the amplitude squared of the oscillation. But in a real system, energy is actually being lost. And so what happens is the amplitude of the oscillation decreases as energy is being lost. So what that looks like is if we start with some oscillation, instead of the amplitude being constant the whole way, the amplitude decays. And I'm going to draw it decaying on both sides like this. But the spring still oscillates, the system still oscillates. And so what it oscillates in between is these two lines which we call the decay envelope. Right? So it's still oscillating back and forth. But as it goes on, as it goes on in time, the amplitude decreases. I'll put time here. So the equations that describe this, so we can, we can describe this line here, which we call x max. So this is say the, ma the maximum amplitude. We can describe how that changes in time by this, by this equation. So there's some original amplitude that this is, and then there's a decaying exponential that describes how that amplitude decreases. And it depends on this parameter B, which we'll talk about. The full solution, which is this, just X of T, is actually described by this times our old friend, the, the simple harmonic motion. So X of T is equal to A naught times E minus over two M. That's this decaying envelope part. But then we have our old friend cosine omega d plus phi. And the difference is, is that our omega is now this omega dampened and has a bit of a special form. The special form it takes is k over m minus b squared over 4m squared. Okay. So this is, these are the equations we're working with for now. This is our original, right? If it was a mass and a spring, this is our original thing. And this term is actually caused by drag. That's how we're gonna model the energy being lost in the system. So we're not gonna go through a full derivation. I just wanna show you like, why does this ever appear? Why does this constant ever appear? So if we imagine our mass on a spring. Okay, so we've got our mass on a spring. Well, what is the net force on this spring? Well, F net is equal to negative Kx, right? We know that's from Hooke's law. But what we do is if this is subject, if this mass going back and forth is subject to some kind of energy loss or or drag, we model that by saying, well, there's some coefficient drag times some velocity that is is causing is adding a net force. And so this should this should uh, sort of ring a bell, right? Like you get drag when you move, right? And you don't get drag when you don't don't move. So it should be dependent on v. And it turns out that the bigger the drag coefficient is, the more energy will be lost in these systems. And with this, we can get a big differential equation. So um, if I write this, I can write m. Well, what is f net equal to? Well, it's equal to the acceleration, which is dx dt squared, right? It's the second derivative of the position is equal to negative kx and this is minus b, and what's the velocity equal to? Well, it's equal to 
maybe x. And so this is a big differential equation that you can solve. And the solution to this equation, one of the solutions, is, is this, with omega d being this. Uh, we're not going to solve it, but it just shows you where that solution might come from. Um, and why that B appears, and why that B is used to model some energy loss, because it usually has to do with some some drag term that's that's stopping it. It can be things other than drag, uh, but this is how we're going to model it. It's and so we're going to call it our our damping constant. So the last thing to think about is if these are equations that are describing our motion. Well, there are a couple of interesting situations that happen here. So you can have you can have k over m be bigger than b squared over 4m. So this is just a regular damping situation. So that would make a positive number. Um, and this is just, so the thing would decay and it would oscillate. So this is just damping. There's the case where k over m is equal to b squared over 4m. And so this is called critical dampening, damping. And what we notice here, if k over m is equal to this, then omega d is equal to zero, right? Um, and there's actually no oscillation. So the system just decays down and goes down. Uh, it turns out as fast as possible. Um, and so critical damping, is often what we want to use in shock absorbers in cars and stuff like that. Things that we don't want to bounce around, we try to critically damp. There is the case where you have k over m, which is less than b over 4m. And so this is called overdamp. So if you have too much damping, it actually slows you down. Like the, the you, you, there's no oscillation, but it takes too long to get back to equilibrium. So any offset takes too long. So you don't want overdamping. You always want critical damping if you're trying to get rid of oscillations. You know, this becomes an imaginary number, and then imaginary numbers do weird stuff in cosines, and we're not going to really talk much about it, but essentially what it does is it turns a cosine into a decaying exponential. Um, but that's for another math course. Um, and then the final case that we're going to spend a lot of time with is when k over m is a much, much bigger than b squared over 4m. And it means that if it's much, much bigger, then omega damping is essentially equal to just k over m. And it reproduces our original angular frequency for simple harmonic motion.